Welcome to the Wyoming Women's Business Center's 2021 webinar series. Today's presentation is how to maximize seasonality in your business. My name is Christine Langley and I'm with the Wyoming Women's Business Center and I'll be your speaker today. All participants will notice the Zoom webinar bar on the bottom or top of your screen, depending on your orientation. And I wanna call your attention to the questions panel. If you have any questions during the webinar today, I'd like you to use those to communicate with me. And then immediately following this presentation, we'll go through a Q&A and then we'll finish up with a survey. And we ask that everybody completes the survey because it provides us and our funding partners with valuable information. So everyone's muted today on this call to minimize background noise. So once again, if you have any questions, just type them into that questions panel and we'll get to it during the Q&A. So we're gonna get started with some quick information about the Women's Business Center for any of you that are new to us. And then we'll dive into our topic and finish up with the Q&A at the end. This is our 30 minute format. And so we appreciate everyone joining us today on what might be your lunch hour. This is being recorded and it's gonna be available on our YouTube channel. You can just go to youtube.com and search for Wyoming Women's Business Center. I ask that you subscribe to our channel and go ahead and check out all the other business education content that we've provided over the last several years. So the Women's Business Center is a nonprofit organization and our mission is to enable and empower Wyoming entrepreneurs. Of course, we have a special emphasis on women and women that are economically or socially disadvantaged. And so we do our work through three distinct programs. The first is our business counseling and training program, which is always free. The second is our microloan program, which offers loans anywhere between $500 up to $50,000. And that's for businesses that have been denied from a traditional lending source. And then last but not least is our artist development center. We run that in conjunction with our Works of Wyoming store in downtown Laramie. All right, so let's dive into our topic today on how to maximize seasonality in your business. And so as just a quick recap, we know that there are two overarching categories of seasonal businesses. Those that see the majority of their business during a particular season, and then those that completely close during the off season, like a ski resort, for example. And seasonality can really depend on your product or the service that you're offering. And so some companies experience very little seasonality while others have really strong periods of feast or famine. So I like to break this down even further and get started by talking about just the four specific types of businesses that are most affected by seasonality. And so the first is companies that are tied to a type of weather. So industries like landscaping, snow plowing, HVAC, you know, they depend on certain weather conditions to flourish. And so sales for those industry types are going to vary depending on what the weather's like. But keep in mind that this also depends on your area, right? So if you're a landscaper in Southern California, your business really isn't seasonal like it would be if it was in Wyoming. All right, next up is companies that are tied to a holiday. And we all know that the holiday season typically refers to the time between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And it's a really big sales period for most retailers. But for some businesses, they're tied more directly to a holiday, like say Valentine's Day for florists or Halloween for costume manufacturers, right? So in those examples, seasonal effects are likely to be consistent and predictable every single year because they're tied to a holiday. Next up is companies tied to a calendar date. So there are some businesses that have a spike in sales on certain dates of the year. So for example, the start of the new calendar year might trigger sales for industries like insurance um, or fitness centers, right? They have a predictable calendar related sales. Um, we know that people have a tendency to join gyms as a result of New Year's resolutions. And that's why fitness membership enrollment is 50% higher in the month of January than any other month. So if you're a company that is tied to a particular calendar date, then that's a form of seasonality. And then last but not least, companies tied to weather-related travel. Um, that can spark a lot of business for travel and tourist-fueled businesses. We know that heavy travel seasons help boost outdoor leisure activities like skiing or camping or whitewater rafting. And we've got plenty of those businesses catering to weather-related travel here in Wyoming. 
Now, I understand that most companies don't fit neatly into one of these categories because almost all businesses can experience some sort of seasonal effect. But for our purposes today, I'm going to recommend some actions that you take in your business to really maximize your success if you're seasonal. And so I want to start by just getting a sense of who is on the call with us today. So I'm going to launch a quick poll here. And it is asking you which answer best describes you. Do you own a seasonal small business right now? Are you planning to open a seasonal small business? Or are you just interested in learning more about seasonal small businesses? All right, terrific. Thanks so much. Just gives me a sense of who's on the call with us today. All right, so let's dive into some of these tips and ideas I have for you. Now, I always start out by recommending you do some research to understand your seasonal fluctuations, especially if you've been in business for less than two years. So you may think you have a general understanding of how your business is affected, but until you've done the research and have some hard numbers to review, you really don't have enough information to determine what your business plan or strategy should be. So the best people to talk to is really other businesses in your same sector. They don't have to be in your area, not asking you to call your direct competitors. They just need to have similar conditions. So ask these business owners how they're impacted by seasonality and what level of fluctuation they see in their business. You know, you'd be surprised how much information people will give you if you just ask. You'll want to ask questions like, how do they cope with their seasonality? Um, if they had to do it all over again, what would they do differently? And after you've exhausted other business owners, then I recommend that you do some online research and even ask your sector's membership body or guild. You know, almost every industry has some type of an association uh, that you can sign up and belong to, and they can be a wealth of knowledge because their job is to do research in your industry and share that knowledge with their members. All right, that brings us to our next action item, which is preparation and planning. So once you have the seasonality information, then it's important that you respond and plan accordingly. And you're gonna to wanna to build what you've learned into your business model. So for example, movie theaters don't shut down in quiet seasons like some other seasonal businesses, but they do plan to hire extra employees for their two busiest seasons, which is summer and winter. And they create their budgets to reflect that increased income. Other examples are wedding planners or photographers and caterers, right? They know they're gonna thrive in the summer months, especially in Wyoming, and they plan accordingly. And I often give my own um, business example. I had an ice cream company for seven years. We operated in both Wyoming and Colorado. And in doing my initial research, I found that my revenues were expected to drop by 65% in the off season. And in Wyoming, that's like eight months of the year, right? So that fact really completely changed our planning when it came to the amount of overhead that our business was gonna be able to afford. And we quickly made some important pivots that helped us stay profitable year round. So you've got to understand your cycles and it's really important that you don't waste time in that kind of hopeful mode um, that somehow it's going to be different for you versus everybody else. Just do your research and respond accordingly. And so I always encourage my clients to look at your off season like a pro sports team. It's really your opportunity to train and get ready for next season. All right, so maximizing seasonality in your business really comes down to two key areas. The first is marketing, and the second is cash flow management. So let's just start with marketing. Um, every business out there should develop a marketing calendar, but for seasonal businesses in particular, that planning and preparation like we just talked about can be a make or break situation when it comes to marketing. So each month you'll notice if you take a look at the calendar is sort of a different awareness or national event, right? That you can harness for your marketing. So for example, January is a good month as we talked about for health club memberships or self-help books and programs. Um, whereas February is generally the slowest month of the year for retail, but we know it does feature Valentine's day and that triggers a great deal of seasonal business. So I encourage you to just sit down with a calendar and figure out your marketing campaigns during that high season, as well as your low season, 
if you don't completely close, and then figure out the cash and the resources you need to implement the marketing strategy or the marketing plan that you're hoping for. And remember, if any of this sounds overwhelming or beyond your current skill set, it's always a great time to ask for some help. It's what we do here at the Women's Business Center. So be sure and reach out to us for some one-on-one -on -one counseling if you need some work specifically on your marketing, you know, or your cash flow management, which we'll get to in a few minutes. All right, another marketing tip is working with others. Okay, so let's say you're a small business in a tourist location. It could be difficult for you to attract visitors on your own, but the community as a whole may be able to create some kind of off-season demand. So ski resorts I talked about in the very beginning um, as a great example of a seasonal business, they've actually started to develop summer downhill biking programs. And that brings tourists back to hotels and restaurants in the community. And you can help your community to find ways to attract off-season visitors. So remember that a small business, as a small business owner, you're a very important piece of the ecosystem for your local community. And it's in everybody's best interest to support you. So I encourage you to get involved with your local community, economic development agencies, and see how they can work together. It's really an important component of your marketing for your business, and especially in our small towns in Wyoming. So I'm gonna launch another quick poll, and I just wanna hear from everybody how you plan on being involved, or how do you plan to be involved with your local community? What are you doing now, or how do you plan to be involved? So do any of these things ring true for you? Are you a member of your local chamber? Are you involved somehow in the local economic development scene? Are you a board member or a committee member for any local nonprofit, right? Are you part of an association or a member for an industry group? Do you do any volunteer work in the community or for school? Anything that you can do to get engaged in the community is gonna help market your business, especially as a small business owner. All right, terrific, thanks guys. Okay, if you understand cycles in your business, then you should do a good job then of completing your cash flow projections. And that should accurately assign money in your quiet months. So that way you have a realistic sense of how much money you'll have at the end of the year. Now, the importance of cash flow management, it really can't be overstated when it comes to business and especially seasonal businesses. So I'm gonna spend the remainder of our time today giving you some specific cash flow management tips because I truly believe that these skills and activities are gonna make or break your seasonal business. All right, so first up is get educated and financially literate. So you should be able to understand your balance sheet and do simple cash flow analysis. And if you don't know enough to do financial analysis, then you owe it to yourself to really improve your financial IQ. And you can do that in a number of ways. There's so many education topics that are free online. Um, you can look for webinars on our YouTube channel that talk about cash flow and budgeting and financial management. You can work with an individual business counselor at the Women's Business Center. You can reach out to an accountant or a bookkeeper. I mean, there's just endless ways in order to improve your financial literacy. You can read books on this, um, but it's an important aspect of your business. And you should always be educating yourself on money because it really is the lifeblood of your business. All right, next up is engage in cash planning. So this is when we talk about forecasting and budgeting because it's gonna help you see the big picture. So whether I'm talking about cash flow projections or forecasting or budgeting, it's sort of all the same thing, right? It's just semantics. It's different words to say, understand the inflow of money that's coming into your business, the outflow of money, the money that's going out of your business on a month to month basis. You wanna design a budget that reflects your business's seasonality. So if you know you have a ton of sales that are gonna come in in say October, November, and December, then you wanna reflect that in your month by month cash flow projection or your budget. That means that your costs may stay flat or they may go up during those time periods, right? But you want your budget to reflect the reality of your business. You wanna be looking at a picture that makes sense. 
And so next up is analyzing your situation regularly. So I have way too many clients that only take a look at their books, you know, maybe once a quarter or twice a year. Um, some wait until the very end of the year and then throw it all in an accountant and hope it works out. And they're just looking at their bank balance to see if they can transfer money from their business account to their personal account. Um, this is not regular cash flow analysis. So if you're doing regular cash flow analysis, it lets you track the flow of funds in and out of your business. And so I want you to try and make it a habit of examining your finances every single month and at the very least quarterly. And if you're really on top of it, you might even look at it weekly so you know exactly what's happening in your business. Get a handle on your fixed and variable costs. So I mentioned before, knowing about the inflow and the outflow of money, knowing your fixed costs helps you with forecasting, right? If your rent is the same every single month, if your car payment is the same every single month for your business, um, you know that ahead of time, you can easily forecast those expenses. And when cash is tight, you can potentially look to cut back on variable costs or variable expenses. We know that your fixed expenses aren't gonna change, but your variable costs might. So better still try to even link those variable expenses that you have to revenue. If you can't, last but not least, if you can't or just won't manage your cash flow, then I wanna encourage you to hire someone to do it. So if you don't have an accountant or a financial analyst in-house, you can hire an expert to handle this part of your business. There's lots of people out there that um, you know, do this stuff every single day and it's easy for them. Uh, and they could help you do cash flow analysis even just a couple hours a week, you know, um, less than 10 hours a month. They could easily manage this for you. So I encourage you to reach out to someone if it's just not in your forte and it's not something you're gonna do. It could be the difference between surviving in business and not. All right, so I wanna get a sense of just your personal financial literacy. So I'm gonna launch another poll and I just wanna know where you'd rate yourself on a scale of one to five. How would you rate your financial literacy? Five means that you have some kind of a background in bookkeeping and accounting and you're really comfortable with it. One would mean you rarely, if ever, reconcile your bank accounts and money in general is just a negative place that you don't like to talk about, right? So where are you at on a scale of one to five? And again, this, these answers are more for yourself so that you know, hey, I need to be doing a little bit more or learning more, you know, or I've got this. All right, guys, thanks so much for sharing. Okay, so next up is saving aggressively during the high season. I call this saving for a rainy day. I really think it's a sign of strength and maturity for a small business to have a cash reserve. It's really just the smart thing to do. You should do this in your personal life. You should do this in your business. And you should be setting up a system to save, especially during your high season when the majority of your income is flowing into your business. Now, some people can make this automatic through their bank, and then other people save a certain percentage of profits each month. Whatever works for you and your business is fine, but be sure you build in a savings plan to your budget. Next up is working with a lender to set up a line of credit. So this can help you through the slow periods. Most lines of credit for businesses are established based on your accounts receivable. That's a fancy way of saying it means they're based on the money that customers already owe you for services that you already performed or products that you already sold, right? But you just haven't collected it yet. So you've invoiced it, but you haven't received the payment yet. That's where this line of credit comes in. And so you really wanna get this established as soon as possible after opening your business so that you have a cash lifeline if you need it. As a, as a business owner, you're not expected to be your own bank, right? But you are expected to manage your cash flow. And having that line of credit established is part of managing your cash flow successfully. It's one of the reasons banks are in business for other businesses. All right, next up is taking advantage of tools and resources at your bank or your credit union um, that they have available to help you manage your cash. So these are things like overdraft protection, 
mobile deposits, right? Solutions for automating your invoicing and bill payments online. Um, I want you to be sure to read the fine print so that you understand any fees that are associated with these services. You know, banks are there to help you and to service you, um, but they're also profitable businesses. And so, of course, they have to charge money for their services. So it's okay to pay for some of these services, especially if they help you manage your cash flow. I just want you to be sure that you know that those fees and service charges are part of your budget. Okay, next up is reducing the time that it takes to get paid by your customers. The best way to do this is really with better invoicing. And you need a process driven way of collecting your cash and then a systemic or systematic follow up system that helps you track it. So lots of accounting software is already set up to help you with this process. And all you have to do is understand how to engage it. So again, if you need help, there's lots of resources available for you, the WWBC just being one. And then lastly, consider alternative funding methods. So these are options besides traditional lending institutions. If you find yourself not qualifying for say a line of credit for some reason. So our microloan program could be an answer for you. And there's also temporary cash flow loans from online lenders, but I always caution people to be careful about the fees and terms associated with those. Um, there's peer-to-peer -peer lending work, networks, but for most of us, of us, most small business owners, the loans that we get are typically from friends and family. And so I always tell my clients, you know, don't look for money when you need it. <laughs> look for these types of backup resources when you aren't in a crunch. Start having those conversations now. Research what your options actually are. Ask your friends and family now if they'd be willing to help you by issuing you a loan if you got into a crunch and you needed it. Figure out what the numbers look like, what the terms would be. So if you do need to go ask, it's not the first conversation. You've had this conversation before, you've got people or resources, lending institutions, you know, different networks set up in order to help you. Okay, so quick question for everybody out there. Another poll, I'd like to know, yes or no to this. I have a savings plan in place for my business and I currently have cash reserves to cover at least one month of expenses. Are you in the yes camp or the no camp? It's always good to answer this question for yourself. And for those of you in the no camp, we need a plan, we need a budget. For those of you in the yes camp, congratulations. And I'm glad you're on the call just to confirm that you're doing all the right stuff. Okay, great job. All right, so another tip is to use customer deposits to help with slow periods. So often businesses can charge a deposit, right? Um, people that service the wedding industry do this, photographers do this, caterers do this. Um, I even have some medical service providers that are now collecting scheduling deposits because there's such a high no-show rate for some appointments. Um, a deposit can really offset your upfront costs. And it can also help you purchase inventory if that's something that you've got to do for your business. So again, caterers and photographers regularly require deposits. Lots of other service providers are starting to do this as well. Um, so take a look at your industry and figure out if that's something that would help your cash flow a little bit um, and also help confirmation with some of your customers. Another tip is to slow down payments. Now, you want to be careful to not annoy any of your creditors and suppliers and don't necessarily want to be paying fees for this. Um, but during slow season, maybe you don't have to be Johnny on the spot on making every single payment. So if you're given 30 days, if you're given 60 days, you know, don't pay it right when the bill comes in. Maybe wait until you're up against it and then send the payment in. Um, this can help your cash flow situation. If this isn't an option, then you could also consider paying with a credit card. But again, you wanna do this really cautiously because of any charges that you might incur, you gotta make sure that you can pay that off so that you don't have interest on top of you know, lower profits and adding significantly to the cost of your business. So this gets back to your financial literacy and your IQ in that category. 
If you're um, experienced at this, if you're organized, if you know that you can pay this off, if you can stay on top of it, um, then this is a helpful tool in cash flow management. All right, next up is negotiating with some vendors. You can always ask your vendors and your suppliers for a discount on any early or upfront payments, or you can ask for an extended payment term that better suits your business needs, right? It never hurts to ask. <laughs> the only thing that they can say is no, and that's where you currently sit. So you'd be surprised how many vendors will work with you. Again, they want to please you, you are their customer. Um, and so again, if they know you're good for it, maybe they're okay giving you a little slack and, and an extra 30 days. All right, next up is offering your customers multiple payment options. So I always like to say, make it super easy for people to pay you. You can use services like Square or Clover or PayPal to accept credit cards. You can even have your customer deposit your payment directly into your bank account. A lot of accounting softwares are offering those ACH direct transfers. So I want to just uh, give you a heads up about um, apps like Venmo. If you're using them for business, um, Venmo now has a separate, separate business services category, and they've changed their policy now because so many businesses are using Venmo for payments um, and not paying the business service fees. So now any payment that occurs on Venmo, this is actually starting tomorrow, um, July 1st, or this week, I think June 30th, July 1st, I just got a notification. Um, Venmo changed. And if any payments are noted for services that look like a business, they're going to automatically charge you a fee for that payment. So it's going to be in the same realm as using PayPal, you know, or Square or Clover, or one of these payment processing apps. Um, so if you're a small business out there using Venmo, just a heads up on that. All right, and then lastly, lease instead of purchase. So from a cash flow management standpoint, you know, I understand that sometimes leasing in the end, you might pay more, but leasing can free up additional cash to run your business. And if that's the case, you may be more profitable leasing than actually purchasing. So it's always smart to ask yourself if you should pay cash up front or lease. Sometimes taking on business expenses is just smart financial management. But these are choices that really come down to your own level of financial literacy and your own track record of paying down debt. So those are all things that you need to consider in leasing or owning your space. All right, now, if these cash flow projections or cash flow management, if all this is something that sounds super intimidating or confusing, then this is the point that you wanna stop and ask for some help. And Wyoming has so many free resources that can help you. The Women's Business Center is just one of those. And so I always like to mention that as a business owner myself, it's really important that you look for any and all resources that can help your business. Wyoming is really uniquely positioned with just an abundance of small business support. And remember, you know, one meeting or one interaction with one agency should not discourage you from continuing to solicit help. You know, different economic development organizations, they have different expertise and different abilities. And just like any other service provider, like a mechanic or a dentist, you know, we're all different and unique. So if you don't get the information or the assistance that you were hoping for from one, then I just encourage you to try another. You know, if I go to a dental hygienist and I don't like the way they clean my teeth, I don't stop getting my teeth cleaned, right? I just ask for a different hygienist or I change dental offices. And the landscape here in Wyoming is really ripe for professionals in economic development that are just waiting and willing to work with you on your business. So again, I just encourage you to reach out. All right, guys, I've just left a minute or two for questions. So feel free to type in any questions that you have into that questions panel, and I'll monitor that while I wrap up. Um, I just want to thank our funding partners. You know, we are made possible through some partnership agencies, primarily the U.S. Small Business Administration and the Wyoming Business Council. And here's some contact information on the screen right now. Um, I'm in charge of business education at the Women's Business Center. And then Jonathan is our primary business counselor. And so contact information, direct information for both of us if you'd like to reach out. And of course, you can always go to our website at wyomingwomen.org and sign up as a client and we will contact you from there. It's always free. Okay, upcoming webinars. So the month of July is really all about networking. 
And so you can visit wyomingwomen.org, click on the training button um, up at the top, and it'll take you to all of the different webinars that we're going to be hosting. Our next one's going to be on July 6th, talking about what is business networking and why is it important for your business. So I encourage you to sign up for these early and often and join us in July. All right, looks like we were thorough today, not a lot of questions. Um, so I'll go ahead and close out since we're on our 30 minute format and ask you to complete the survey at the close of this webinar. It's gonna pop up right when we close. Thanks everybody for attending and we'll see you next month.